You are now entering the LuxCore Studios. And you've secured a seat for the Protecting Your Radius podcast. Here, Here, we build connections from your contracting profession to some of the top bleeding edge products and services. Don't get deterred. Let's not delay. Here is your host, Nathan Downs. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Protecting Your Radius podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Downs. Hey, guys, on today's episode, just going to be sharing some thoughts with the state of the marketplace. If it feels like everyone in our podcast space and across the nation and various business podcast spaces right now is talking about the economy, is talking about people, how they're spending, why they're spending, why they aren't spending, all these different things. And hopefully I can encourage and probably will end up discouraging some people because again, my beautiful wife uh, reminded me, she, <laughs> she asked me the question when I get on here and do these, she's like, why are you so mad? Um, and I think that's a good place to start because I don't have like a core, like a core reason to be upset, but I think especially in our market where you have hundreds of people that build fences, do gates, et cetera. There's so much substandard work often that like not even on the level of professional that it just kind of irritates me. And the bad thing about this whole message here that I'm going to share with you guys from my heart is that, you know, I hear these statistics saying, and I'll think of fence because fence is probably the lowest barrier of entry besides painting or something like that. Um, into the construction trade as a subcontractor, period. Okay. And I I think where I get upset with it is there's allegedly some 50,000 um, companies or fence companies or, or companies involved in fencing or, you know, one man operations that do fencing that probably shouldn't even be considered a company nonetheless. Um, and there's, at least 30,000 then like for sure that are never going to hear this message that are never going to see this. And I think that's what disappoints me the most is we start talking about how to grow the industry and how to connect with more people. But I, I am concerned often that there's tens of thousands of people working in construction that really honestly don't care. They don't want to be better. They don't, you know, they just want to do their thing, do it however they think is right or however they desire to do it. And it, it's always going to create an uphill battle for the clients that they serve. Okay. So I, I'm seeing a lot of panic in my market, particularly from the young guys already, because it, it is slow. And they're like, you know, I haven't closed anything in a couple of weeks and this, that, and the other. And I know who they're competing against. They're in over the past few years, they've been competing against people like me, like the company that I came from, you know, the established brands. And, and again, I'm, I'm talking when I say me and what we're doing at radius, like I'm talking about a newer company, but we've done things to position ourselves in the market as leaders and not just getting on Facebook or Instagram or something and saying, you know, like we're a fence leader, you know, in the, in the local Tulsa market or whatever. No, that's not true. No, we are a leader. We have done the things we do have the team. We do have the resources invested in making a better product and a better experience for each one of our customers. So Rewind that my soapbox end of the, <laughs> of this for the young guys is it was super easy the last couple of years, like real easy. Now it's back to normal, maybe a little bit harder in some circumstances. The problem is now you're competing against me where before you were competing against dollars and time, right? Where you could come in and you could sell something for 20 to 30% below market value. And there was so much of it that you could overcome the fact that you were give that you weren't properly running your business 
or you weren't properly setting things aside for the future to grow. But what did you guys do? You did grow. I see you. You bought trucks. You bought tools. You bought machinery. I love it. Love it. But there was no goal. There was no des- like like a destination to get to as you purchased these things, as you invested these things. You were just taking money and putting it in, and I always will. I wanted a new flatbed. I I didn't want to run my pickup truck and trailer for forever and stuff. That's awesome. Man, I got this little beaver. You know, now I got an auger. You know, I'm 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 big time. I'm taking the next level. Do you have a helper? Yeah, you know, helps every Saturday, you know, when they're free or something like that. Okay, all right. That's cool. Um, but there was no like plan. Um, no, I didn't get a website or my website's trash because of some Wix garbage that, you know, looks terrible and no one why would I pay someone to do that? Why would I pay someone to coach me, to like give me some ideas, to help me navigate the business side of things? I What's a business write-off? I don't even know what that is. Like, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I know my CPA down at Jackson Hewitt and stuff. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Jackson Hewitt ain't no CPA, okay? Like, they don't give a crap about your business. H&R Block, you just roll in there with receipts and stuff. And they're going to charge you thousands of dollars, especially for you young business guys. And they don't care. That is not like when when you hear other people that are doing it and that are growing businesses, like that's not what that is. But what, what happens? We see a commercial on TV. We get hit by something. We get a, a reference from our uncle who's broke, but he's had 47 different business businesses over his 60 years on the planet or right or something. And, and he's the one giving you business advice. He's the one that's telling you how you should run your business and what you need to do. And if you're smart, you do this. And I'm like, you know, I get it. We all have one of those in our family. We all have one of those in our sphere, right? But we have to hear, like, we have to listen who we're taking in. And, and again, this is preaching to the choir, but I hope that somewhere this like bleeds out and someone sees it to understand that you have to take ownership and responsibility if you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur. Like you have to make the decision that today the buck stops with me. I am going to be the reason that this this thing succeeds or fails. And I've I've I saw it. I just read it online before I got in the freaking studio this morning. And I, I saw some guys in my market that are younger that are like, you know, oh, I'm never going back to a job, man. I'm never doing it. And they're all talking about these jobs. And I'm like, why are you talking about jobs? Oh, it's because you're dead slow. Okay. What are you doing not to be dead slow? They don't even know what to do. They don't even, they ain't even going to listen to this because this is a simple first step in growing and getting better. So I'm not going to leave anybody hanging. How do you grow and get better? I would contest. The first thing you need to do is start reading books. Everything that you see that comes out of my mouth, that I have read a book, I have heard someone talk about a book. I've, there's so many things that you can consume. Audible is $15 a month and you can get a credit per month. I think you can get a couple extra, three credits. You could get three books for 30 bucks. Still, that's cheaper if you just want to listen to them. You can go to a used bookstore in your town. There is one, believe it or not. But there's a used bookstore. You can go in there and you can find the classics. You can find the newer aged ones. You can find stuff about self-improvement, self-help, business stuff, business acumen, business everything. And these are the things that I think why like a easy first step that will differentiate you from others is is just reading and enlarging your, you know, your database, basically. Right. You know, I, I, I look back to and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but my dear friends, Marshall Gudgel and Ab Colby, because when I was a young guy, these dudes were like avid readers. And I was not a reader, man. Like I went through high school and college and I, I, I cliff notes my way through everything I possibly could. I mean, I was smart enough, um, naturally that I could, uh, overcome the fact that I wasn't reading any of this stuff. I hated it. 
Um, it reminds me a lot of my own kids. They're like, I hate reading. And I'm like, oh my gosh. But when I finally did it for me and finally did it for what, what things I could unlock, you know, outside of myself, then I really got it. You know, it's funny. Like I think of like the Count of Monte Cristo and uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I read to, to Kill a Mockingbird. Fantastic book. But uh, Count of Monte Cristo, like I was not into that at all. But I do remember in the same, oh man, it must have been 16, 17, in the same time I read the uh, Frank Herbert's Dune book. And that thing is that freaking big. But I do remember reading that book. But why? Because I was so immersed in the idea. Like I, So then I quickly realized it really had to be something that I was interested in or passionate about, but also something that I can learn from. Because believe it or not, I could learn something from those crazy fantasy sci-fi stories and stuff. So I start reading books. I, I, these guys are going, do you want what we have? Yes. And at the time it was like, you know, building business and success and money and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want that. Sure. And they said, so read these books. So they gave me some really simple books. I've mentioned it before. There's a, there's a lot of books. The first one that I read all the way through was the traveler's gift by Andy Andrews. Um, phenomenal book. Uh, it is still to this day, uh, my favorite fiction book, um, that I've ever read. Uh, it has changed my life in more ways than anyone could ever quantify or explain because it gave me seven principles in a, in a format that finally made sense to me about what, what the world was around me and what ownership I had in the world itself. Okay. That makes sense. So reading is a great start. You could start anywhere. You can, um, for those of you guys struggling with communication and verbalization of your messaging and stuff, um, I would uh, suggest um, Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference. Uh, Chris Voss is a, uh, I'm going to pull up some notes here. Uh, Chris Voss is a great communicator. He was a, a, the lead um hostage negotiator for the FBI for forever trained all hostage negotiators around the world and stuff. And this dude is a freaking stud, but never split the difference by Chris Voss is an amazing book um, that you guys have to read. The other one was um, it's called the third door by Alex Ben and Ben Benny <laughs> try to say that three times fast. But Alex's book, The Third Door, has some really, really valuable, rich um, content in there. He's younger. Um, that book is not that old, but it is a really great example of giving you guys some ideas how to act, how to talk, how to work your way into business dealings. And those things can overflow into, you know, into day, daily success for your business. Um, other... Other ones, anything by John Maxwell, um, you've got to start there. And then you got to work on yourself. You got to work on your own internal, like, what what do I believe that the world is? What do I understand that the things going on around me mean? Um, three books that helped me with mindset um, for success. The first one was uh, The Millionaire Mind, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Ecker. Awesome book. You've got to read that. I quickly realized that I had bought into the concept and the foundational truth to me was that rich people were bad. And that came from my parents. So I had to overcome that because what I found was every time that I would get any type of money, I would expel. I would literally like throw it back and be like, oh, you know, I don't I don't want to be a bad person. So I'm going to get rid of that money real fast. I'd blow money everywhere. Never save a dime. You know, God, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be rich because my mom and dad said that I might be bad. So I don't want to be bad. So I better not make any money. <laughs> uh, looking back, that's uh, funny. But like, it's not funny when you're in it. It's not funny if you don't even know that you're in it. So that's a great book to read just to start getting your mindset correct about how do I view the world and money? How do I view that finance side of my life, of my business? And especially if you're running a business, if you guys are running it or have a business, you have to read books like that. You have to challenge yourself to make sure that you're not doing something that will, unbeknownst to you, like subconsciously blow up the entire thing behind you because it can happen. 
and people do it every stinking day. Nine out of 10 businesses fail. I bet you a huge, huge, huge part of it is how the owner or the founder thinks about money and how money works. So another one, uh, another book on mindset stuff, um, I think I might've mentioned a second ago, but uh, the 20 irrefutable laws of leadership by John Maxwell, I said John Maxwell's name, but like he is a great, great teacher. It gives you these foundational principles that you can use in your life to be a better person, to be a better communicator, better husband, father, wife, sister, brother, mother, uh, everything, uh, be better with your communities, be better in any organization that you volunteer with any organization, any of your full, like philanthropy things, oh, terrible verbiage there, <laughs> but maybe I should go back and read a book. But, um, uh, the last one that I was thinking about, um, for mindset was, um, sun stand still sun stand still geez by, uh, Stephen Furtick. Um, that book is a very interesting concept um, from a, a story in the Bible. So if you haven't heard of that or haven't seen that, that is a really cool one just to get your mind thinking about how the world works, um, supernatural things around us and stuff like that. Of course, with a Christian bias to an extent, but there's a, a lot of really cool fundamental truths uh, built into that book, Sun Stand Still by Stephen Furtick. So all right, so you got to improve. You got to read. That's an easy place to start. Second thing was doing this. You're already listening to this podcast. Yay. Um, you made it. You did it. Uh, but there's people that haven't. How do we share this content? How do we consume this content? How do we get it out to the people that don't listen to it? Um, you're already ahead of the game. Just by being here, just by listening to this, you've already made it one step. The, so the third thing I would say, so consume what you need to um, content wise. There's so many people out there talking about this stuff. You know, I, I don't know how long I'll be doing this, but, uh, you know, I got a couple things to say and I'll share those things. And hopefully you can find some value in any of it. But especially for the young guys and gals out there listening, um, take everything in. This wasn't around 10 years ago. It really wasn't. It wasn't like it is today. It wasn't part of our culture to a point of, you know, I look at uh, I look at someone I admire a lot, Pat McAfee and his team and what they've done. Now they're on ESPN. They've got the, you know, all these different things. But I've been watching them for six, seven years to when he started, when he left Barstool Sports and started his own thing. I think it was that maybe it was only five years ago. Anyways, ridiculous, right? Like maybe it was five but like Pat McAfee and his crew, it's just a bunch of his buddies, but they had, they had a goal. They had a vision. They did. They just were authentic, authentically themselves and then shared that with other people. Come to find out we're all, there's a lot of us that are in the 20 to 40 range that we are all the same. <laughs> I mean, we all think the same things, have the same jokes. So, so you listen to these cats and it's like, oh my gosh, it's like hanging out with my buddies. Uh, you know, just, just at the house, you know? So, um, but finding content, finding information that meets you where you're at and, and talks to you. Tim Ross is another guy. He's a former pastor, left the church, all this stuff, but he loves to share some things about what's going on in the world. Uh, I think it's, uh, the, the basement is the name of his podcast. Love that podcast. Uh, he is a, absolute dog. I mean, that guy is changing the way that so many people view everything from whether you, you, you believe in God, you don't believe in God, you do this, you do that. I mean, this dude is a, you know, he is a chaos bringer <laughs> in a great way, very positive, but very like straight. Like there's a lot of things that Tim Ross says that challenges me just to be a better human being. And I like that, right? That goes to the third point. You have to have a coach. You have to have a mentor or someone in your corner. Like I, I've said this before. Um, I love the fact of, you know, Dan Blanc over at My Fence Life and Dan Wheeler over at the Fence Industry Podcast. And these guys have oft, have been echoing this as well. 
But that coaching aspect, like there's something there. You know, I, 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 I re, re, again, I read a book, surprise, surprise. But I remember one, I cannot remember the freaking name of the book. It doesn't matter. But Bill Campbell's the guy's name. I've mentioned it on the podcast before. I know there is a bunch of you that did not do anything with it. Now is the time that I'm saying it again. You need to look up who Bill Campbell was. You need to find his dadgum book and understand this guy was like and like finished his working life as the coach for Eric Schmidt at Google, president for the president of Google when it blew up, and uh, Steve Jobs at Apple, right? Steve Jobs. Like he was a business coach. He coached a couple of other Silicon Valley greats. And Bill can't like if you need a Bill Campbell to be that high up in the corporate food chain that is literally shaping the world, you you gotta have, you know, you can't you can't be it doesn't work. I don't know. It's it's so hard to explain, but having a coach is imperative to have someone in your corner that can give you unbiased opinions and advice and look at things through a different glass. You know, I think that's one of the biggest things I've told Randy Ward this since uh, we brought him onto the team uh, two months ago, but that was one of the biggest reasons I constantly was hounding him over the last four or five years. I think I'm like, Oh man, we need to work together. We need to work together because I need you as a, as a, a conduit in between what my goals and dreams and visions are now, very rarely will it be someone in your organization, especially when you look in an organizational chart, you know, where, where do they fit on the pyramid, you know, (laughs) that they're below you. Um, but it also depends on your organization and what type of people you're recruiting and training and teaching, right? Like I bring someone in like that. So I'm utilizing that experience from someone like Randy that has so much more. It's the same thing I've done with Donnie since the day that he came over and started with me, you know, always bouncing things off of that. I have an idea and an expectation for what I think is correct, but you have a lot more experience doing this. What do you think about this, Donnie? How do you look at this thing? And he interjects his thought. Doesn't mean I'll do it every time. Very often it does mean I'll do it to an extent, right? But, but it's the same thing with Randy. It allows someone else to see what we're looking at. And if I'm coming in from the from the right, he's coming in from the left, and we're going, okay, now where is the true answer? Is it in the middle? Is it skewed one way or another? I don't know. But it does help having that extra set of eyes. You don't have the resources. You don't have the team in place or the ability to do that at this time. You really need to get a coach. You need to hire a coach, pay the money, it's the same thing. I, I, and I've talked about this before. It's the same thing with me and going to the gym. I could go to the gym. I chose for a number of years. That's how you get looking this good. <laughs> I chose a number of years to not go to the gym and not pay attention to what I ate. And unfortunately for me, that is something that you can physically see my challenges in the universe, right? Because I made those choices to ignore those things for a period of time. Okay. Well now we're working out all the time, watching what we're eating, counting macros, doing all these things, kind of, kind of setting things up for the success that I want to have, um, health wise the other way. Right. But again, I could choose to go to the gym and just, you know, meander around like so many people do it. Like it's the beginning of the year. And frick, you could go to any gym right now that is $10 a, a membership and you walk in there and you, I, I bet we were talking about this at our gym. I bet 3% of the people going to the gym right now have a plan. May not even be that much, but it is a very, very small percentage. Now, what's funny is that percentage may grow a little bit over time because what have we come to find out? It's the same thing that we found out in the last 20 years about all of this, there's more more information and more data today than there's ever been in our lives. Our, like Just the fence industry is a great example of that, where you're seeing people innovate and do things in ways, and it may not always be the best, it may, it may, but there's people out there that are trying to do something different, that are trying to 
take maybe something that's super old and how can we make this super old post-driven idea? Like how can this become mainstream? Because look at what's going on there. Now it suddenly is like just suddenly. And there's some of you that have been doing it for decades, right? You ad guys have been doing it since the beginning of time, right? But for the rest of us, it's an innovation. It's something different. It's something that we hadn't seen put into the market right in front of us before. And now is the time for that. But, but, but it's because of the data. It's because of the inf- everything is it, it's Google. Everything's right in front of you. The plate is right in front of you. What do you choose to put on your plate? It's a buffet of information like we've never seen before. And it's only going to continue to grow. So that segues into the closing thought of this talk. I tamed it down. Ashley, you should be happy with me. I tamed it down pretty good, I think. But there's a buffet of information. The competition, the level of competition has never been higher. How have you positioned yourself to be different? How have you positioned yourself for success? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. Do you have a coach in your corner? Do you have someone, a mentor in your corner that can help you look at things and say, that's a terrible idea. You know, there was a guy yesterday on Facebook, say something. And I know there'll be a handful of you that watch or listen to this episode that you saw my response to a gentleman, um, not terribly far from where I'm at, actually, right up I-44. And, um, yeah, he was talking about being super dead and none of his advertisings work. And immediately I I saw that and I thought, I, I keep seeing people out there saying stuff like this. And I saw responses start coming in. Oh, you just got to do this and you got to you know, don't oh, keep your head up and, you know, uh, grind through. Yeah. Grind through. Yeah. I like, okay. All right. And I'm sitting there thinking, all right. Yeah. These responses are okay. Who is this guy? I don't know him from Adam. Right. You know, so I'm like, all right, whatever. Get on my phone, start swiping, go to Google immediately. So I found his information, right? Go Google his company. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, is brutal. I think his Google ratings were one star, uh, better business bureau, all sorts of stuff. Lots of complaints, um, lots of bad pictures of, um, substandard work, not professional, unfortunately, you know, and I immediately thought I was like, you can't overcome this. You can't overcome this and expect you to stand on the field with your competitors when they're not involved in that type of stuff, you know, they're up there putting in cedar privacy fences as the standard, which is that marketplace. And you're providing treated fences, half the price. And the craftsmanship is just, it's non-existent. Okay. So I had to say that, you know, I'm sitting there thinking I would, you know, close your business down change the name and try again or quit and go do something else or go get a job at another fence company. What, why I said that and, and why that's important for some of you all to hear. And again, I, I I'm fearful that no one that needs to hear this is going to listen, but whatever, I'm going to say it anyways, <laughs> because everyone else listening is probably going to agree with this. I would assume and be like, man, eh, that's true. It's okay to fail and it's okay to not have success if you never set yourself up for success in the first place. Like if you have created a brand and an image of that where there's people literally saying like, I mean, I think a kindergartner could have built this better. Like you should probably quit um, if it's true. Okay. There's a lot of mean customers out there anymore. If you're a customer, you can be nice to contractors sometimes. (laughs) Um, But, you know, we make mistakes, right? Um, You know, this gentleman talked about, you know, he had some bad crews and stuff. But 
where where I, I I felt like the failure is 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 not in the fact of making mistakes. It's not in the fact of hiring guys and having substandard work put out there. We we all deal with that. Like that's not unique. Okay, so what do you do? You stand behind what you've put out there. You don't make excuses. You show up and you go, what the freak is that? <laughs> and your clients already going, that's kind of what we thought. This is trash. And you're going, hmm. And you have a choice to make in your mind. You have a choice in that moment to either do the right thing, which is like, you know what? This is not right. We need to rework this. We need to redo this. I need to tear this down. It's going to cost me thousands of bucks. But I'm the type of guy that will tear that thing down and rebuild it if that's what it takes. I'm going to figure it out, right? But are you the type of person that is going to make an excuse? Well, you know, the guys, they didn't really feel real good today. But when you called the office this morning, you know, and you were hounding us, you know, I, I you said you'd start this project today. Well, you know, my guys are sick, man. All right, we're going to go ahead. Yeah, you know what? We'll come out there. We'll come out there. We'll get it started. Oh, okay. And then you go out and produce that. Then the customer's going, man, maybe I, maybe you guys were sick. You probably should have stayed home. Oh, yeah, should have stayed home. I told you that on the phone. I'm like, you know, and I'm making all this up. But it proves the point. How do you react to the adversity? How do you decide who you want to be? How do you decide what you want your company to be? Again, whether you own it or run it, it's all the same. Like if you're running a company, you're still the face of that franchise. If you own the company, you're the the buck stops here. You're the end of the line of that franchise. It's just what it is. So you have to decide before it ever happens, but you have to make a conscious choice on how you're going to react to that adversity and what you're going to do. As I've explained before, if you guys listen to Downtime with Donnie, you've heard the stories. You know, there was a job last year that happened around Memorial Day uh, that was just a complete disaster. Um, was it a disaster on our part? We made a couple mistakes. The customer could not get beyond those mistakes. Uh, it was going to be at the point where I was just going to end up having to sue her. Uh, she had terrible reviews and things, which were completely untrue online. And I made the choice of eating thousands and thousands of dollars in cost and, and then not charging her to just walk off the job, have her erase all the negative stuff that she put online, drop all her complaints everywhere and just go away. And if you listened a couple of weeks ago on downtime with Donnie, you'll know that I, I have been back several times to see all the things that she hate. I hate this fence so much. And I'm going, I mean, that's a beautiful cap and trim fence. Okay. Well, we'll see. Um, the fence has never been changed, never been altered. The new sods out there looks great. Took my fence sign off, of course, because that was part of the deal. Told her I never wanted to see her again. <laughs> but um, you look at the fence. It's beautiful. Go around to the front of the house. Brand new. Brand new driveway, sidewalk, approach to the front door, all new concrete. So I knew, and just like I got to tell my kids and my wife, I was like, I actually bought that lady's driveway, sidewalks, all, all that concrete work is new. And it was a cool teachable moment, even for the kids. I don't know how much they were listening, but the fact of it that they got to see it and they're like, why did you buy that lady a driveway? So, well, it's because she was upset with the fence. And um, we ate the rest of the cost. I was like, we couldn't come to terms. It was a terrible, terrible deal. The couple mistakes, she wouldn't let us back on the property to fix. I fixed many of them myself. Uh, but nonetheless, that's kind of where it ended, right? And I told both my kids, I was like, this, this is just showing you. I had a choice in at that point, I was at an impasse to either suck it up and know that that we were never going to come to terms on anything or go down that road where we're fighting, we're doing all these different things. You've got someone upset that's just a terrible, terrible cancer 
on all of the good things that we've done in the market and the things that we're continuing to trying to grow for. And if it caught, I mean, if it, it did, I mean, five, 6,000 bucks out of my own pocket, just literally like, here you go. Um, it was worth it to me to focus on the positive things, to focus on where are we going? And this, is this job going to take us down? So I stand on some principled nonsense about, you know, well, I built it exactly the way that it was spec'd, exactly how I sold it to you. I did all these things. That is true. But she's, no, you didn't, you didn't do this. Okay. So I have to, you have to sit back and decide when do you cut your losses? And all of that is very hard. That comes back into maybe that's where you need a coach. Maybe if you're not mature enough, if I, <laughs> if this is 15 years ago, no, nah, you bet. I, I would have taken that lady to court and not even thought twice about it, but I'm older. I don't have that kind of energy for that anymore. Like I said, I'm trying to keep things positive. I'm trying to move things in a certain way, but there's some of you that aren't selling jobs right now. And I even had this thought at the beginning of the week, you know, first of the year rolled around. I'm sitting there thinking, man, we're, we're dead. We ain't gonna have nothing come in. And I decided, I said, I'm going to really hone in on some of these opportunities that we have right on the table in front of us. By the end of the week, sold, I think five or six jobs, each one of the jobs, anywhere from eight to $20,000. I mean, just like that in a couple of days. And I'm going, I thought it was dead. <laughs> I thought no one was buying fences anymore. I go online and I thought all these people are just honing in. I'm not going to do nothing. And, um, had one or two of them that are doing financing. Uh -huh. So put that in your back pocket, make sure you have that available. But on top of that, there's always someone out there buying. There's always someone looking to They're They're going to have a need. One of the clients has dogs. He has a new house. He has to put up a fence. Like it doesn't matter if he doesn't want to, if he doesn't want to pay for it, what I get it, I get it, but he, he, he's got a new house. He has to have a dog. It's just, it's just what it is, right? There's always a need for what we do. That's the really cool thing about being in anything that has to do with physical security, anything like that. There's always someone that has a need to protect what they value most. And as we talk about is our core value, our core mission statement is that radius. Um, we're here to create environments to protect the things that people value most. And that could look like a number of different things. It could be as simple as building a, you know, extension off the house, like with a pavilion for their pool or whatever, or, you know, building a fence, to keep their dogs in the backyard or keep the kids safe. If they want to go outside and play, um, you know, you got a bad neighbor, Joe Everest. And I've talked about this a million times. You got a neighbor across the way that, you know, keeps looking at you weird, you know, put up an eight foot tall privacy fence. They won't look at you anymore. <laughs> we'll hide them, you know, whatever it is, there's always a need in what we do. There's always people trying to protect something and you just need to figure out what your messaging is to get back to that. So wrap this thing up, put a bow on it. That's that for the young guys. I really want to focus this back on the young guys and gals, people that are newer in the industry, those COVID babies that Wheeler and I have been talking about. Um, you, you don't be too prideful. Again, I've saw a couple of you already saying this. I'm not going back to a job. You're so young. What if, what if going to a job, would have taught you the one thing that you needed to do to make your business successful. What if, what if it, that is it? What if your pride keeps you from the true success that God's intended for you to have, that the universe wants you to have, but you have too much pride to swallow your pill and go, you know what? Maybe today wasn't the day. Could you imagine if you came back into business in a handful of years, a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser, with some more money in your pocket? What if you closed down shop today, came back in three or four years, reopened, 
and you heard from a client that said, man, when you, when you shut it down, I was so, I was so upset because I thought that you could do it. But now seeing you come back, I know you can do it. And I know you have what it takes. And how satisfying would that be if that is the reaction of the marketplace after we remove ourselves instead of being like today or doing what's already happening right now? You know, I tried to post a thing. There's a guy in town on Facebook in my market, 40% off all fences. He's been running this ad for, you know, 45 days already. I'm sitting there thinking, as a consumer, <laughs> I'm going 40% off a fence. Good Lord. Were you like raking me over the coals before or are you just not like making money now? It's one or the other. Like you were making way too much profit before or now you're, you know, giving, giving away the house, you know, just to keep your hands moving and your feet moving. I don't know. But maybe, maybe there's some of you that can take a step backwards and figure out you need to learn more. You need to invest more in yourselves and take that information and create a better version of you in the future. There's no reason to struggle. There's no reason to kill yourself just to, you know, again, I, I want to say I mentioned this a week or two ago. It's very popular for everyone to be an entrepreneur right now. And I think that's great because I know for a freaking fact that this country was founded and built on the backs of those people that had the gall and the wherewithal to do something different and expand and you look at the giants of the industry through the industrial revolution and everything that happened after that, all every single person that's ever changed the world stuck their neck out in a way. But be aware, there was a lot of things going on in the background. They either had unbelievable uh, talent that they just worked even harder and it all combined into this mammoth of success. They had unbelievable opposition that they had to physically choose. Like we, if you're watching or listening to this, you probably don't have unbelievable opposition. I, I would, it'd be tough to say, right? But there's someone out there that's grown up in the, in the hood, in the projects that, you know, has a parent that's working two, three, four jobs doing all sorts of stuff, scrubbing things together. And they're seeing this and they're seeing that grind. A real, that's a real grind. Like we can get out there and talk about, like, I'm not going to, you're not going to hear me talking about I'm out here grinding. No, you know what a grind is? It's, it's the single mom in the part of town that lives in a 500 square foot apartment. That's trash. That has two or three kids because baby daddy's gone or multiple baby daddies bounced on them. They don't know what to do. They, they're working a job. They have a legitimate job and then a couple side jobs just to try to put food on the table. Keep that shelter over those kids' head. That that like, like that's a grind. Like what we do isn't a grind. Do we have to grind things out? Of course we do. But a real grind, like that's a grind. Like that is something that you can look at and go, if that person is given the opportunity, maybe, just maybe, the world could change. And there's someone out there that may be getting into construction one day that's one of those kids, right? That is looking for a shot. And what's funny is we want to talk about our business, our trades, knowing that especially in ours, in the fences and gates, it's the lowest barrier of entry. Like I mentioned painting and some other, like there's, there's a couple that are so, the barrier is so low for entry that you can get into these things. And maybe that's where the next generation comes. Maybe someone that's really seen a grind that wants a shot. And I hope to God, a man, I hope to God that that's what the future entails. I I mean I hope I hope that those kids find me and want to work for me because one day I promise their lives will be completely different. It'll be unlike anything they've ever seen. But that goes back to the coaching side. That goes back to having a mentor. That goes back to having someone in your corner that wants more for you than you want for yourself. Because I can tell you 
it's exciting to see success come in. It's exciting to have, you know, professional success over my career more than I deserve. You know, I'm a multi-time college dropout. I just couldn't do it. Um, I know my potential was way higher than what I had done in the past. And, uh, but, but I squandered so much of it. And now as I've gotten older, I'm like, gosh, dang it, man. I wish there would have been someone, you know, and, and they came in in my life at certain points, but I wish there would have been someone when I was real young, when I was in high school that could have seen what, what I, what I had the potential to be. And I heard him say it, but no one ever, like people would say like, oh, you're going to be great one day. You're going to do great things, but no one ever did anything. Like we could talk about all these things all we want, but what are we doing? Like what, what, what are we doing to, if you see someone that you think is worth the time, like what are we actually doing to make that happen? It's tough. I don't have any, any time already. I get that. Which is why I'm having to in this new future in 2024, we're in the next year. I'm evaluating every single thing that I'm doing. I've got to figure out how to maximize my time and to make it more beneficial for my family first, but then those directly around me. Because I don't want to feel like, like, just like the podcast here, I don't want to hit sit here and share all these thoughts and give you my heart and, and a piece of my mind. If it's never going to lead to action for one of you to actually freaking do something like it's like to me, that is completely waste. I don't need to hear myself talk. I, I don't need to invest this hour of time that I've put into it. If no one is going to do anything or no one's going to challenge their own thought process to become a better version of themselves. And that's as simple as it is. So I hope you got something out of that. I appreciate you listening to my personal rant here for the day. Um, but man, uh, I, I'm expectant of each one of you that have listened through this 45 minutes. I'm expectant that you're looking at 2024 um, through different lenses. I'm expectant that you want to make this year even better than the last or the last several. I'm expectant that if you don't have a mentor or a coach in your corner in whatever part of life that you want to improve in, that you're going to look into doing that and you're going to figure it out. And it's hard. You know, no one ever said it's not, it's not cheap. It's not easy to have a coach, but it's worth it. You're not going to become some jacked up bodybuilder and stuff like that. You know, like if you want to get yoked and I mean, you could do those things over time, but how much easier would it be with a coach? How much easier would it be with that accountability built in from someone that can look at the things around you? I feel like I sound like a broken record, but I want success for so many people. And, and again, you young people in my industry, you've got to look at yourself and swallow your damn pride and decide today what is going to be most beneficial for myself, my family, or my future family. Is continuing down the road and the path, the way that I'm doing it, like, is that really like, do I have all the skills and information I need to really have the success that I could have? I, I, I feel really, really, really high that many, many of you do not have all those skills. Sorry about it. I really strongly feel that in my heart today. And I feel like someone needs to hear that. So we ain't going to talk about this much more because I'm not going to get on here and have negative podcasts because I know some of you all I'm expecting emails and shit to come back to me, excuse me, uh, going, you know, oh, Nathan, he's being mean again, Blah, or whatever. I don't care. But anyways, I want to encourage you guys is 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 tough love talk as I possibly can to know that you that if if you f even have that feeling in your gut that you could be better than you can be. And today is the day to make that choice. PC next week. You've been listening to the Protecting Your Radius podcast from the LuxCore Studios in Bixby, Oklahoma. Thanks for sticking around and connect with us and all of our partners at www.protectingyourradius.com. We want to thank our premier partners. LuxCore, the newest line of premium quality composite infill to slide into your fence track fence system. Frame your style today. Also, Stain Track, the world's first patented standalone stain machine. 
Utilizing flood coat technology, Stain Track covers boards, pickets, posts, and any type of dimensional wood you can think of. And what better way to use your Stain Track machine than to use the easy application Wood Defender family of stains? Wood Defender goes on easy and covers in one coat with no back brushing. And of course, the true power of our show is you, the listener. Please rate and review our show on whatever platform you consume this content. Your five-star likes and reviews help other contractors get the message that we all want to be better and do better. And in the construction world, we can never forget that before you can be great, you've got to be good. Before you can be good, you've got to be bad. But before you can even be bad, you've got to try.